Alright, uh, welcome to week two of Composition 2. Now, I'm recording this a uh, few hours after we got done with the first uh, Blackboard Collaborate sessions, and I do want to try to apologize again for any uh, confusion there was about the scheduling of those sessions. Uh, what actually happened was when I uh, created the announcements for uh, 21, 000, for section 21003, uh, I actually uh, did not change the time in the announcement. The time, actual time of the session that I scheduled for you guys was noon. Uh, and the other section, which is using a different uh, page in eCampus, was set, set for 1 o'clock. Uh, so that's why there was some confusion there. Uh, I have posted a correction since uh, in regards to that, so uh, we'll just make sure that we're on the same page with the right schedule. Uh, 21003, your session is going to be at noon on Thursdays, and everyone else, yours is going to be at 1 on Thursdays. Okay? All right, so uh, we're talking about this week was making arguments. All right? Uh, we're going to be getting into what you're going to need to know in order to create a classical argument. So, to make an effective argument requires an examination of the issue close enough so that you understand it well enough. Okay, Research is key. Uh, we spent a lot of time in 1301 talking about doing proper research, uh, checking sources, uh, doing uh, due diligence as far as library sources go. Uh, this is why. When you get into argumentative essays, the more research you have done on the topic, the better you're going to be. Uh, the uh, better your end result is going to be. So once your research is complete, there's going to be four main tasks to perform in order to create a good argument. Uh, one of these is develop a main argument appropriate for the rhetorical situation. Okay, You're going to be coming up with a thesis and a primary argument that you want to use uh, for your particular purposes. Uh, then you make an appeal likely to be persuasive to your intended audience. Uh, getting back into the 10 core concepts, keep in mind who your audience is, uh, who they are expecting you to be, and who you're expecting their, them to be. Uh, are they expecting you to be on their side, or are they expecting you to be an adversary? Support your claim with appropriate evidence and or reasoning. Okay, uh, So make sure that you are going through uh, with your good reasons why you support that argument and uh, your evidence to support those reasons. And then adopt a format and style appropriate for the rhetorical situation and medium. Uh, what are you going to be presenting? How are you going to present it? And what is the best way to present your argument so that is the most effective? Let's talk about developing a main argument. As a writer, you must have something to say. Okay? Exploration of the topic will help you to develop your main argument. However, this is not the same as your position on the issue. Okay? The main argument is going to be what you're trying to prove at this juncture. Your position is going to be how you feel overall about the subject, uh, how you feel about all issues in regards to that subject. Now, on page 177 of the text, Jagelski gives an example of this process. Uh, he shows a progression to the main argument going through four parts, okay? Uh, those being topic. So first off, what are you writing about? What is the baseline topic that you have in terms of what you're working with, okay? Uh, just in general, what kind, what kind of t subject matter are you dealing with? Uh, then you have the problem. What needs to be fixed or what questions are there about the topic? What kind of stuff are they asking you to uh, resolve? What kind of uh, circumstances are you walking into? Then you have position. How do you feel about the problem? Uh, what, how do you approach that problem and what side of the issue do you find yourself falling on? Okay. What kind of uh, thinking do you have? And then main argument, what practical, actionable position can you take on the problem that aligns with your position? So here's the difference between position and argument. 
Your position is how you feel about it. Your main argument is going to be what can we do about it, okay? And that argument is going to be based on your position. All right. So, uh, to help you start thinking about developing a main argument, uh, I want you to take a look at exercise 6C on page 177. Okay, that one specifically. To start thinking about an argument of your own. Okay. Uh, so there is three parts to this. First off, identify three issues that you feel strongly about and write a brief paragraph about each one explaining your position. This is something that you can do in the journal. Okay. Describe a main argument you might make supporting that position. Second, find two or three arguments about the same topic, preferably on different sides. And then you want to write a brief synopsis of each one including a statement of the writer's main argument, then compare the arguments and look at how each writer takes a stance and develops their arguments. Okay, So basically what you're going to do is write a little summary of what the argument is that they're presenting and then uh, compare the two. Compare the elements of both of them and see how they're uh, approaching it, what kind of stances they have, how do they develop their arguments if it's differently to each other, uh, what kind of differences do you see. Then third, think of two or three changes you would like to see at your campus or workplace, and then write a letter to your college president, principal, or boss to argue in favor of the changes, developing a main argument for each change. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a role-playing exercise. Uh, honestly, we can't really do campus stuff right now because obviously we're not on campus. Uh, but you can think about your workplace. Okay, you can think about other places that you frequent. All right, uh, if I, if you notice something that really needs uh, addressing, really needs a change, uh, then you can uh, address that over the course of your essay of your uh, brief letter. Okay. Uh, I do recommend taking about 20 minutes for this exercise, okay? Uh, what you're going to do is actually just choose one of these options and perform the action that is requested. Now, uh, it does say here you can ask for help from your team for this exercise. Uh, if you have contact with your team and you think you, they can help you with this, uh, then go ahead and ask for that assistance, uh, either through the discussion board uh, or through uh, private channels, okay? Uh, or if you feel like you can handle it on your own, just go ahead and do it on your own. All right, we'll go ahead and let you pause the video for, I guess, say about 20 minutes uh, let you, to let you write this stuff down into your journal. Okay, again, I, I should also note these are all three of these exercises, whichever one you pick, uh, you should probably be writing it in your journal as opposed to anywhere else. Okay, so we'll give you about uh, 20 minutes here. Uh, go ahead and uh, pause me and uh, we will allow you to uh, do the work.
Okay, and we're back. So, uh, next step of this is going to be considering the rhetorical situation of your argument. Now, you need to recall the work you did in Composition 1 in regards to rhetorical situations. Uh, and that, those concepts equally apply to arguments. So this is all the things that you have to consider uh, when you're considering what you want to write about, what argument you want to make. So first off, what is your audience's pre-existing knowledge about the topic or situation? You'll need to account for the audience's pre-existing knowledge and biases for or against your position and or your particular arguments. So, again, you have to decide whether your audience is going to be a friendly audience or if your audience is going to be a not-so-friendly audience that may immediately assume that they oppose you, okay? Uh, and you're going to have to try to win them over. All right, so... Uh, keep keep in mind, you need to take account of what your audience believes about the subject already before you can go into trying to convince them otherwise. Uh, second, what is the audience's interest or stake in the issue? Okay, How does it affect them? How, do they, how does the argument affect the people you are directly addressing? Uh, you want to make sure that it does, even if they may not realize it yet. Okay. This will make things more challenging. You will have to also argue that it does apply to them in addition to what solution works best for them. Uh, this can be really difficult because there's a honest fact about people is that sometimes they do not know what they need. Okay, uh, There are some times when you need to express to them, hey, this is an issue. This is an issue that will ultimately affect you you may not see it as that right now, but ultimately it will. So you're going to have to convince them that it is something that they need to care about. Okay? Uh, the next is, what does your audience expect? On what side of the argument is your audience? Are you approaching them as an ally or as an adversary? Your tone in the argument, which means your language choices, will be affected by your position in relation to them. Uh, because of the sincere lack of civility that's come about in recent years, this is becoming more and more difficult. You still have to treat your audience with respect, even if they are opposed to you. In fact, especially if they're opposed to you, because if you come out uh, with both barrels blazing, uh, sending insults left and right, uh, that audience is going to tune you out and you will not be able to convince them of anything, much less whatever point you were trying to make. Okay, so uh, you want to check what your audience is expecting of you. Okay, if it's a friendly audience, then yeah, you can you can uh, make as many uh, innuendos if you want. Uh, you can, uh, as long as you know that they're going to support you and not take you down a notch because you're doing certain things or, or making certain references. If you have an opposing audience, an audience that's really going to be hostile, you are going to be treading on eggshells. You are going to be having to use your best language, the most neutral language you can. You will also have to be as respectful as possible to that audience and do not just assume that they're a bunch of clueless rubes. You're going to have to uh, use your language carefully to let them know that you respect they have a differing viewpoint than yours, but, you, but at the same time, they should listen to you because you have a valid point to make. Now, this is a very difficult question that we're dealing, we deal with all the time with classical arguments. Do you have to win the argument? Okay. As a reminder, this type of argument is not the same as an everyday argument, which is more, again, more akin to a fight than a discussion. Okay. A fight needs to have a winner. Okay. Either that or both of you guys are going to be knocked out on the floor. Uh, a discussion does not necessarily have a winner. It's more about illuminating and getting the truth out there. Okay. Uh, so, as a result here, your argument does not necessarily have to be a winning argument in order to be influential. The main idea is to advance the knowledge presented on the subject. OK? 
Okay, there are many examples of arguments that wound up being losing arguments, but at the same time, they did eventually advance the thinking on the uh, subject or advanced uh, societal positions or uh, brought something to light. Okay, uh, there's actually an example in the textbook that works for this particular uh, case, and that is a the arguments that were made by uh, Nazi by the Nazis uh, for enacting anti-Semitic laws. Okay, uh, they're used in, in the textbook as an example of immoral arguments. Uh, that may have the strength of rhetoric behind them, but they, at base they are still immoral. However, the the losing argument in that case, because this is laws that were passed in 1938-1939, uh, around the start of the Holocaust, okay, uh, the losing arguments were the ones that were influential here because they brought they brought this situation to light that hey, this is what this is what's happening to the Jews here. Uh, now, granted, at the time, there weren't a lot of countries that were listening to it, but over time, as we're getting more and more uh, detached from it, as history has moved forward, uh, we're seeing that the losers in that discussion were actually the ones that were on the right side of history. Uh, they were the ones who ultimately would have been uh, vindicated in that, uh, yeah, the uh, Nazis passed these laws, but at the same time, uh, they really contributed to the downfall of the country in general, uh, not not solely because the uh, leader was a megalomaniac who pictured himself to be the next Julius Caesar. Okay, so uh, occasionally, though, the goal is to achieve common ground. Now, if you take a look in your textbook on page one seventy nine, and this time I actually have my textbook with me, so I can uh, go along with this. Okay. Uh, Yagelsky paints a situation where arguments presented in a gun control argument can reach common ground by finding a goal shared by all the participants, and that goal ultimately is reducing violent crime. Okay? Uh, and on page 179, it's in this box marked Focus, okay? And it's specifically talk about do you have to win the argument? Okay, here's what we've got in this box. In theory, an effective argument persuades an audience to accept a proposition, adopt a position, or take a course of action. In reality, an argument can achieve its purpose without necessarily persuading readers to adopt the writer's position, especially when it comes to issues about which people have strong views. For example, imagine that your state legislature is considering a controversial ban on certain kinds of firearms. Citizens support or oppose the ban depending on their opinions about gun control. An argument against the ban is unlikely to change the minds of those who support it, but it might influence the discussion. Because both supporters and opponents agree that lowering crime rates is desirable, an argument that the ban is likely to reduce violent crime would probably interest all parties in the debate. The goal is to contribute to the debate and influence how others think about the issue. Okay, That is the ultimate goal of a classical argument, whether it's a winning argument or a losing argument. The goal of it is we need to advance thinking about this subject and start a dialogue and help people to understand that there are going to be different viewpoints. Okay. Oh, and that sometimes those viewpoints are going to be shared uh, by both sides rather than one side has one set of values, one side has the other set of values. All right, so consider the rhetorical situation. Uh, there's some more con some continuations of those exercises that we did earlier, okay? Uh, when we're talking about composing arguments, once again, you're gonna choose one option and complete that exercise. Now, uh, again, if you, you can ask for assistance from your team if you need to, okay? So, the three options here. Number one, look at the arguments you previously composed and identify an appropriate audience for each argument. Write a brief description of each receptive audience. Okay, this is assuming that you uh, read, wrote all three arguments from the previous one. Uh, in this case, I just want you to concentrate on whichever single argument you decided to write. Okay, uh, take a look at that argument and try to see who you think an appropriate audience would be. Okay, and describe that audience, uh, again, in your journal. 
Uh, number two, find a published argument you agree with on a topic you care about, and think about what it would require to rewrite that argument for a different audience. Okay, uh, This is going to go above and beyond the uh, social media ar uh, arguments that I was asking you to look for last week. Uh, this one, you're probably going to want to look for uh, either syndicated columnists or editorials, uh, something that's going to be talking about a subject that uh, you care about with a viewpoint that you align with. Okay, And then you're going to have to try to think of how a different audience might be influenced by that argument. Okay, Rewrite it a bit so that uh, it's suitable for a different audience than the original one. Then number three, think about writing about a controversial topic to an audience opposed to your position. Okay, So again, you have to be very careful about what language you use. Summarize your position on the topic, then summarize your opponent's position. And then finally, identify some arguments that may appeal to the opposing audience to find common ground. Uh, that is the goal here, is you're going to be looking for ways to achieve a sense of common purpose between yourself and your opponent. Uh, so find some way that you guys can come together. Okay, But first off, you have to make sure you are summarizing your position succinctly and you're summarizing your opponent's position both succinctly and accurately. You don't want to be committing certain uh, logical crimes uh, such as conflating an argument so that it looks like it's something that it's not. Okay? Uh, this one won't take nearly as long. I'm going to let have you guys pause this uh, for, let's go about five minutes or five minutes or so, I think. Yeah, that should do it. Uh, why don't you guys pause the video for five minutes and then uh, we'll come back and we will continue on with the lecture.
All right, and we're back now. Okay, so uh, you may recall last week I told you that there was a difference between argument and persuasion. Okay, that is not to say that argument does not have a persuasive element. Okay, writers use persuasion to strengthen arguments, not in place of arguments. Okay, so classical arguments will typically use three types of appeals. Okay, uh, first you have ethos. Okay. Ethos is arguments based on the character of the speaker. So who is the one who's delivering these comments? Uh, and why do they have the authority to make that statement? Okay. What makes them trustworthy? All right. This comes down to the reputation of the speaker. Uh, then you have pathos, arguments appealing to the emotions. Okay. Uh, what are you try what kind of emotions are you trying to evoke? Uh, what, how do you want your audience to feel about this while they're thinking about it logically, while they're thinking about it uh, reasonably? Okay. Uh, that gets us to the third one, logos. This is arguments based in reason and evidence. Okay. So these are the higher thinking arguments. Uh, the logos arguments are the ones that are going to be uh, based solely on rhetoric and based solely on your skill as a logician. Okay. So let's start off with ethos, okay? Uh, these are appeals based on character. Any argument which claims legitimacy by way of the person presenting it is making an appeal to ethos. So in this case, what happens is that your character as an individual influences this appeal. This is based on your accomplishments, your position, your angle of vision to the subject matter, your education, and any other personal influences which make you more qualified to present an opinion on the topic. Uh, some things that will influence the ethos, if you have a first-hand experience, okay? Uh, if you are an eyewitness to, a, to some kind of event or some kind of action, okay? Uh, if you are in a position where you can affect legislation or affect change, or if you are a person who's directly affected by the topic of the argument, okay? Uh, if you are a scholar who has studied the topic of the argument extensively or you've published on the topic extensively, okay? Uh, these add to your ethos. Uh, there are two examples of credible arguments presented on the basis of ethos in the textbook, on pages 180 and 182, okay? Uh, these are the two, the two excerpts. One is from uh, Barbara Ehrenreich uh, from an uh, article written for the Huffington Post. Uh, and the other one is from David Brooks uh, from an article written for the New York Times. Okay. Now, uh, Ehrenreich is an economist. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, I should say, what we want to do is look at the two excerpts without looking at the author's credentials and pre as presented in the text. Okay? Uh, so, we're going to have you listen to this and uh, just with, without continuing on with the video, give me your assessment of whether you feel this person is credible or not. Okay? With, whether they have credibility without the ethical content. That is to say, if you don't know what their credentials are, uh, is it going to be something that's influential? Okay. Uh, and then following that, let's decide how much does the character of both Ehrenreich and Brooks add to the persuasiveness of the work? Okay. So first off, we're going to have uh, the excerpt from uh, Barbara Ehrenreich. Okay. So again, the idea here is you're going to listen to this excerpt. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to uh, post to uh, a new thread in questions to the professor uh, and give your assessment as to whether you feel it's credible or not before you advance to me telling you what their credentials are. Okay? Alright, so here's the excerpt from Aaron Reich. This is from an article titled on turning poverty into an American crime. At the time I wrote Nickel and Dimed, I wasn't sure how many people it directly affected, applied to. 
only that the official definition of poverty was way off the mark, since to find an individual earning $7 an hour, as I did on average, as well out of poverty. But three months after the book was published, the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. issued a report entitled Hardships in America, The Real Story of Working Families, which found an astounding 29% of American families living in what could be more recently defined as poverty, meaning that they earned less than a bare-bones budget covering housing, child care, health care, food, transportation, and taxes. Though not, it should be noted, any entertainment, meals out, cable TV, internet service, vacations, or holiday gifts. 29% is a minority, but not a reassuringly small one, and other studies in the early 2000s came up with similar figures. The big question 10 years later is whether things have improved or worsened for those at the bottom third of the income distribution. The people who clean hotel rooms, work in warehouses, wash dishes in restaurants, care for the very young and very old, and keep their shelves stocked in our stores. The short answer is that things have gotten much worse especially since the economic downturn that began in 2008. Okay, so uh, now, you've, now that you've uh, entered your response on that one, uh, let's take a listen to David Brooks. Okay, again, uh, listen to the excerpt, decide whether they are credible or not, uh, just based on what the writing is, okay? And then once I'm done with this excerpt and you've had a chance to write in your answer, uh, I will go through what the credentials are for both of these authors. So here is the excerpt from David Brooks. Uh, it is from a uh, article titled The Relationship School. The New American Academy is led by Shimon Warenker, who grew up speaking Spanish in South America, became a U.S. Army intelligence officer, became an increasingly observant Jew, studied at Yeshiva, joined the Chabad Lubavitch movement, became a public school teacher, and then studied at the New York City Leadership Academy, which Mayor Michael Bloomberg and the former New York School's Chancellor Joel Klein founded to train promising school principal candidates. At first, he had trouble getting a principal's job because people weren't sure how a guy with a beard, kippah, and a black suit would do in overwhelmingly minority schools. But he revitalized one of the most violent junior high schools in the South Bronx, and with the strong backing of both Klein and Randy Weingarten, the president of the Teachers Union, he was able to found his brainchild, the New American Academy. He has a grand theory to transform American education, which he developed with others at the Harvard School of Education. All right. So now that you've uh, entered your responses on these uh, excerpts, okay, uh, let's talk about the credentials for the authors. First off, we have Ehrenreich, okay? Uh, Barbara Ehrenreich is a uh, uh, college professor. She's an e uh, economics professor, okay? Uh, she's an expert on issues related to the working poor, okay? Uh, the book she mentions in the uh, excerpt is titled Nickel and Dimed on Not Getting By in America. Uh, she is, the uh, book is actually a memoir. Uh, she's describing her experiences trying to make a living by working at low-wage jobs. Uh, so, it's, so it's something that was uh, accessible to a wide audience. Okay? Uh, so the, art, the excerpt that... Uh, that we presented in this is from 2011. She wrote it for the Huffington Post. Uh, so this is uh, in an essay about how the the Great Recession of 2008 affected America's poor. Okay, that was the main focus of it, and that was why she uh, was uh, dealing with the subject the way she was. Okay, uh, so. Really, she does have the authority to talk about this, not only because she studied it, but she also lived it. Okay? Uh, David Brooks is a straight-up journalist. Okay? He works for the New York Times. Uh, he is a uh, pretty professional journalist. Uh, the main thing that he was trying to get across here is the credentials of Shimon Waringer. Okay? Uh, trying to establish him as the expert, 
okay, which he tries to do by giving you all of Warrenker's credentials, okay, the stuff that he's done in his life, uh, the people who have uh, accredited him or complimented his approaches, okay, uh, the people who have given him a chance, okay, uh, the people who have backed him, uh, and some of the things that he has actually accomplished in his career, one of the big accomplishments being turning around that junior high school, which was considered one of the most violent in New York. Okay? All right, so let's talk about pathos. Okay? Uh, this is actually one of the riskiest types of persuasion because it can potentially be overused and abused. Okay? Playing upon your audience's emotions occasionally is okay, but there's a difference between playing on their emotions and preying on them, okay? Playing on your audience's emotions occasionally is okay. Preying on the audience's sympathy in lieu of any kind of logical argument is not. Uh, and that is one of the problems, of, again, we have with modern rhetoric is that a lot of the pe people who are uh, making arguments in... Uh, the news and current events in the government, things like, like that, they're not presenting logical arguments. They're pre presenting feel-good stuff. Uh, they're presenting stuff that's intended to make you feel, okay, things are getting better, okay, even when they're not, right? But here's the thing. Uh, pathos does have a place in logical arguments because human experience includes emotion. Persuasive argument can use this to the arguer's advantage, by making the audience feel like they need to agree with the argument on a purely emotional level, okay? Again, it's very easy to abuse this power, though, because you don't want to just rely solely on playing on emotions without any kind of evidential or reasonable backing, okay? So again, we have two uh, examples of pathos uh, in the forms of writing samples, okay? Uh, one of them is a, a sample from Jennifer Browdy de Hernandez, and the other one is from Kathleen Sebelius, who's a former uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Okay? Uh, we're going to go through the uh, excerpts here, and, uh, and I'm setting up uh, th in the same thread uh, on uh, eCampus under questions to the professor. I want you guys to talk about the uh, emotional uh, effect that these excerpts have. So starting with uh, Browdy de Hernandez, uh, her article is titled the, uh, Stop the Holocaust of Migrating Birds. It's from a magazine called Common Dreams. Okay, uh, And let's listen to her appeal and you can see we can see how she uh, attempts to use emotion. Okay. We'll, listen, we'll have you listen to the excerpt and then write your impression down. Uh, write, write your impression in the uh, uh, forum. Lately, I have been sitting with the brooding knowledge that at least 7 million migrating songbirds were killed this spring, running the gauntlet of 84,000 American communication towers that rise as high as 2,000 feet into the sky, braced by invisible guy wires that garrot the birds right out of the air. This is actually just a fraction of the number of birds killed each year by running a collision course with human activity. This spring has been more silent than ever. The traditional dawn chorus of birdsong has ebbed to a few lonely little souls, most belonging to non-migratory species like cardinals, blue jays, chickadees, and sparrows. They say that when Europeans first arrived on this continent, the migration of the passenger pigeons would literally darken the sky for minutes on end. I have never seen a living passenger pigeon, and it seems that my grandchildren will not know what I mean when I talk about the dawn chorus of riotously busy, happy bird song, any more than they will be able to imagine an apple orchard in full bloom buzzing with the diligent harvest of a million droning bees. Knowledge like this makes me sick at heart. My rational side is aware that mourning is not productive, but another side of me knows that it is one of the special gifts of us humans to feel grief to locate particular sadnesses in this larger landscape of suffering, and to use our sadness and anger at injustice as a lightning rod for change. Other animals and birds feel grief as well, but you won't find the great community of birds gathering together to make plans to topple all the communication towers in North America. No, the birds will go quietly, one by one, into the endless night of extinction. All right, 
so let's go to the uh, next article. Again, this is from uh, Kathleen Sebelius, who's a again a former Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, so her, uh, is, wait, Homeland Security or no, she's Health and Human Services. Excuse me, uh, my bad, wrong wrong H uh, cabinet position. Okay. Uh, so Kathleen Sebelius is writing an article titled The Affordable Health Care Act Strong Benefits to Seniors, Billions in Savings This Year. Uh, again, this one comes from the Huffington Post. Okay, So for this one, same thing as the other one. Uh, in the uh, discussion forum, uh, I want you to talk about what emotions this evokes in you. And then we will discuss it afterward af after you have posted. Okay? So here is Kathleen Sebelius's appeal. Two years ago, President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act. The president's health care law gives hardworking middle-class families security, makes Medicare stronger, and puts more money back in seniors' pockets. Prior to 2011, people on Medicare faced pay paying for preventive benefits like cancer screenings and cholesterol checks out of their own pockets. Now these benefits are offered free of charge to beneficiaries. Over time, the health reform law also closes the gap in prescription drug coverage, known as the donut hole. This helps seniors like Helen Rayon. I am a grandmother who is trying to assist a grandson with his education. I take seven different medications. Getting the donut hole closed, that gives me a little more money in my pocket. In 2010, those who hit the donut hole received a $250 rebate, with almost 4 million seniors and people with disabilities receiving a collective $1 billion. In 2011, people on Medicare automatically received a 50% discount on brand-name drugs in the donut hole. Over 3.6 million beneficiaries received more than $2.1 billion in savings, averaging $604 per person per last year. All right, so let's discuss quickly what kind of emotions these uh, articles evoke. First off, we have uh, Rowdy Hernandez. Okay, uh, her um, hers is a almost a hundred percent emotional appeal. Uh, she's actually trying to get you to feel sorry for these birds, uh, to feel sad for their plight. Okay, uh, she's using some very poetic language here, uh, particularly here uh, the. Traditional dawn chorus of birdsong has ebbed to a few lonely little souls. Okay, that's really poetic language right there. Okay, uh, and this excerpt ends with some poetic language too. These birds will go quietly one by one into the endless night of extinction. Uh, if that doesn't evoke an emotion in you, uh, you may have to check your emotional barometer. Okay, uh, that's a pretty powerful image there. Okay, Sibelius, on the other hand, she's doing going more lot more logical. However, uh, she's invoking sympathetic f images. Okay, uh, she's evoking the idea of hardworking middle class people and seniors. Okay, uh, specifically a grandmother who is trying to assist a grandson with his education. That's a very specific reference. Uh, is something that is intended to evoke emotion. Okay. Uh, Sibelius doesn't exclusively rely on this emotional appeal, though, because she has she has statistics to back her up. Okay. That gets us to logos. Okay. These are appeals where based in reason and fact. Okay. Uh, what must be the basis of for every well-reasoned argument? Logic is the rational structure for an argument. The factual reasons why your argument is correct. Okay, uh, this is strictly based on fact. Uh, this is based on uh, arguments that make sense in context. Okay, and you have a reasonable reason to back that argument. Nothing too out of the ordinary. Even if your argument relies mostly on emotional or ethical appeals, there has to be an element of logic to your argument. Okay. Uh, so, you cannot 100% rely on uh, your credentials or uh, making your audience cry in order to get your point across. You actually have to have some logical content in a classical argument to make your point. 
Uh, so there's two forms of logical appeal that we're looking at here. One is inductive reasoning, where a conclusion is drawn based upon factual evidence presented. Your argument and conclusion in this case is based mostly in the facts you've researched and presented in favor of your argument. Okay, so in this case, you're using you're doing the research first before you come up with your argument. If you look at uh, page one, excuse me, one eighty four. Uh, this is an article titled "College Is Still Worth It" by Mark Yasgier. Yasgiri. Okay. Uh, this has also appeared in the Huffington Post. Okay. So this excerpt is using uh, inductive reasoning. He did the research first before he came up with his conclusion, and it shows in the way he writes this. It's kind of long, but uh, it's worth it to to read it uh, or listen to it as it wears. Okay. So. Uh, follow along with me if you want to, but here's how here's how his excerpt goes. Recently, the Pew Charitable Trust came out with a report that supports what many of us have been saying to critics of higher education. While the system has its problems, by and large, those with college degrees are better off than those without them, even during the recent economic turmoil. The Pew report makes several basic points that should be mentioned anytime someone claims that higher education isn't a good investment. Although all 21 to 24 year olds experienced declines in employment and wages during the recession, the decline was considerably more severe for those with only high school or associate degrees. The comparatively high employment rate of recent college graduates is not down by a sharp increase in those settling for lesser jobs for lower wages. The share of non-working graduates seeking further education did not change markedly during the recession. Out-of-work college graduates were able to find jobs during the downturn with more success than their less educated counterparts. These aren't trivial observations, and they now have even more statistical support than before. The general economic benefits of getting a degree are still pretty clear. That doesn't mean that any college degree plan is a good one, and any sensible approach to higher education, whether at the undergraduate or graduate level, should include a clear-eyed analysis of what one is likely to pay to and receive from a given school. It is simplistic and false to claim that more education always leads to more income or better job opportunities. It is also correct to point out that excessive student loan debt is a terrible burden that may not be justifiable for certain schools or fields of study. But that doesn't mean that it's good advice to tell young people who want to go to college and who are prepared to do so that they shouldn't do so because it's not worth the time or the price. Those with college degrees are still more likely to be employed than those without them, and their prospects aren't bleak. While the phrase caveat emptor is a necessary one to consider in picking colleges and degree programs, the Great Recession shouldn't claim the idea that higher education is a ticket to a better future as one of its victims. Okay, so uh, if you look at the reasoning behind this, uh, it is all based in statistics. It's all based on research. Uh, this author has really done their homework. Okay. Uh, they have presented their uh, argument in a way that shows that it's based solely in fact. Okay. And their conclusion is based on the facts that they have researched. Okay. So this is a good example of inductive reasoning. Uh, the other form of logical appeal is a deductive reasoning appeal, where you begin with a premise and work to a conclusion which follows a logical path from the initial generalization. Okay. In this case, this, the premise is the basis for the argument, and the facts presented align with that premise, leading to the final conclusion. So in this case, you're doing the research after you have decided what your point is, and what your argument's going to be, and now you're, you know, the research you're doing is going to be to find sources that are just going to justify that position, and justify the reasons you have for taking that position. Okay. Now, a basic form of deductive reasoning is what's known as syllogism, okay? Uh, statements that go uh, uh, x, x is true, y is true, therefore x equals y, okay? Or some, that's an oversimplified version of it, but that's kind of what syllogism is like. Uh, there are examples of syllogism in uh, the textbook. Uh, there's one really good one. Uh, the major... Your X premise is going to be a major premise, uh, an overall major premise. Your Y is going to be a minor premise within uh, the context of that X premise. 
So, major premise. Taking a human life is immoral. Minor premise. Capital punishment is the willful taking of human life. Therefore, conclusion. Capital punishment is immoral. Okay? Uh, you've reached that conclusion based on the major premise and the minor premise brought together. Okay? Uh, a lot of logical thinking is a little bit more complex than that, but that is a simple start uh, for uh, dealing with uh, logical arguments. Okay? Now, there is a, another example of this, uh, another sample of writing. Uh, this is a piece by Malcolm Gladwell titled Small Change Why the Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted. Uh, this is from an excerpt from an article written for the New Yorker of that title. Okay. Uh, in this article, Glad Gladwell is actually doing a comparison between modern uh, electronic activism and the activism of the 1960s. Okay. Uh, it, considering the environment that we're currently living through in 2020 is going to seem kind of quaint the way he looks at modern activism. Uh, because we've seen, we've seen examples of how, yeah, the spirit of the 60s is going strong, okay? But let's take a look at his argument here, which is based in deductive reasoning. The platforms of social media are built around weak ties. Twitter is a way of following or being followed by people you may never have met. Facebook is a tool for efficiently managing your acquaintances for keeping up with people you would not otherwise be able to stay in touch with. That's why you can have a thousand friends on Facebook as you never could in real life. This is in many ways a wonderful thing. There is strength in weak ties, as the sociologist Mark Granovetter has observed. But weak ties seldom lead to high-risk activism. Boycotts and sit-ins and nonviolent confrontations, which were the weapons of choice for the civil rights movement, are high-risk strategies. They leave little room for conflict and error. The moment even one protester deviates from the script and responds to provocation, the moral legitimacy of the entire protest is compromised. Enthusiasts for social media would no doubt have us believe that King's task in Birmingham would have been made infinitely easier had he been able to communicate with his followers through Facebook and content himself with tweets from a Birmingham jail. But networks are messy. Think of the ceaseless pattern of correction and revision, amendment and debate, that characterizes Wikipedia. If Martin Luther King Jr. had tried to do a wiki boycott in Montgomery, he would have been steamrollered by the white power structure. And of what use would a digital communication tool be in a town where 98% of the black community could be reached every Sunday morning at church? The things that King needed in Birmingham, discipline and strategy, were things that online social media cannot provide. Okay, so... Here's how Gladwell is reaching this conclusion. His uh, major uh, premise here is that uh, social media is leads to weak ties. Okay. Uh, his minor uh, premise here is that uh, movements for social change rely on strong ties and interpersonal relationships. And then his conclusion, therefore, is that uh, no serious social change can be derived from social media. Okay, uh, I will. I can name a lot of people who are going to say, "Yeah, that's uh, kind of outdated." Uh, you'll probably hear a couple of OK boomers in there, uh, but it's that's the way he felt about this. And what when is this? It was 2010. Uh, Ten years ago. Uh, we thought social media was not going to be that influential in organizing for uh, social change. Uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, pun intended there. All right, so we have uh, we have this idea here of making a persuasive appeal. Okay. Uh, so we have an exercise that I'd like you to, guys to try, okay? Uh, I'm going to set up a separate thread for this uh, under questions for the professor. Uh, I want you to take a look at exercise number two on page 187. It's a question that says, review the following passages and identify the ethical, emotional, and logical appeals in each. Okay? So, I want you to uh, take... 
they're asking you to look for the different types of persuasive appeals. I want you to choose one of the excerpts, and I want you to look for an individual type of appeal in your chosen excerpt. Uh, this is also designed to be a team exercise, but I will allow you to do this individually. Uh, so choose whether you want to focus strictly on a uh, ethos, a pathos, or a logos appeal. Okay? Uh, and then see what you can find in one of these articles. Okay? To give you an idea of the articles, uh, first one is from Susan Cain, uh, excerpt from a book titled The pa Qu Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And then the other one is from an author named, is from Robert Reich, uh, he's very well known right now as a voice of uh, resistance. Uh, he's a former labor secretary from the uh, Clinton years. Uh, Robert Reich's article is titled Super Capitalism, The Transformation of Business, Democracy, and Everyday Life. It's an excerpt from that, a book of that title. So I'm going to have you guys take pause the video again and take about uh, five to ten minutes. Uh, pick one of those excerpts and look for uh, your choice of pathos, logos, or ethos uh, arguments in those uh, are in one of those excerpts. All right, so go ahead and pause me for about five ten minutes, and then when we come back, we'll start. We'll keep. We'll continue. Okay, so we're back now. Uh, now let's get into the nuts and bolts of your first major assignment, which is the classical argument. Okay, uh, your first major essay assignment is to create a classical argument. Okay, uh, again, this is something that in class I would do in teams. I'm just gonna have you do this individually once the as the lecture is over. Okay, uh, I want you to search for interesting topics and current events. Okay. So a good, a good idea, suggestion would be to look at news sites such as newspapers, news networks, or internet news aggregators like not Yahoo News. Okay? I want you to find a single general current events topic that you can agree can be worked with, in, that uh, you can work with. Okay? Uh, so I want you to try to find some current events topic that you can write about that we're going to create a classical argument for. I want you to read some information on the topic and choose an argument to make which aligns with your individual position on the topic. So I want you to focus on creating an argument to where which there are agreeing and dissenting opinions. Okay. 
you want to look for something where people are going to di agree or disagree uh, strongly. All right. Uh, I want you guys to t to initially uh, focus on your persuasive techniques and the facts which will support your argument. Uh, what kind of what kind of approach can you use in your classical argument to convince people that you're uh, that you're arguing the right uh, the right side of things? Okay. Uh, as a suggestion, I would say if it would work best if you find a current events topic that you feel very strongly about. Okay. The stronger you feel about something, the better you're going to write about it. Okay. The nuts and bolts of this. Uh, we're looking at three a uh, length of three to five pages. Uh, it should be double space in your uh, word processor, 11 to 12 point font. Uh, Arial, Times New Roman, or Calibri is acceptable fonts. Okay. Uh, one thing that I do want to make sure is clear here. There are four file types that uh, eCampus will read. Uh, it is uh, doc, docx, PDF, and RTF. Okay. When you submit your file, it has to be in one of those four file formats. Otherwise, it's going to come through as unreadable garbage. Okay. This is especially going out to anyone out there who is using Google's word processor. Uh, Google has a web-based word processor that's kind of similar to Microsoft Word. The problem being is when you save files from it, it saves them in a the file format called dot pages, which is a Google proprietary format that only Google can read. Okay, so when you go to save your file, you have to save it into a uh, file format that's readable by everything else. So again, dot doc is uh, Microsoft Word 2003 and earlier. Dot uh, doc x is modern Microsoft Word. Dot uh, pdf that's Adobe uh, Acrobat file or .rtf, which is rich text format, okay? Those are the acceptable file formats. Uh, it's going to need MLA format, which means that you will need to, on the first page, have a name block uh, with your name, uh, the course, the and the due date, okay? Uh, and you will need page numbers uh, that, adva that advance on each page, okay? That, and your page number should include your last name. Now, a works cited page will be required. It's going to be, have to be separate from the rest of the essay and it does not count towards your page count. So, three to five pages of essay plus a works cited page. You will also need to cite your sources within the essay. MLA format is required for all citations and the works cited page. Okay. Uh, if you have any issues in regards to knowing how to do MLA formatting for this stuff. Uh, the best site, the best source is going to be the Purdue OWL site. Uh, we can we can go over that a little bit when we get into our Blackboard Collaborate session coming up on Thursday. Okay, No matter which one you're going to be uh, attending, we will go through Purdue OWL. Okay, your classical argument must have a clear structure and thesis statement. Your argument and position must be clear in addition to the intended audience for your argument. So you need to not only have a clear argument, a clear idea of what you're going to argue, but you also have to have a clear idea of who that argument is aimed for. Uh, what is your primary audience for that argument? Uh, another thing, as much as possible, your argument must avoid any and all logical fallacies. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a short period here, in a little short bit. Uh, this assignment is due on, uh, man, I'm still thinking in terms of being in person. Uh, this, this assignment is going to be due on September 25th, okay? Uh, that is a Friday, okay? Uh, it is due 20, September 25th at midnight. There are going to be two workshops for this essay, okay? Uh, the first one is going to be the week of September 14th. Uh, you will need to do revision workshopping in your teams. Uh, you, that, that is to say you will need to upload a draft of your essay to, uh, e, to eCampus, to the team discussion threads, uh, and you will have to give feedback on those discussion threads. 
And then week of September 21st is going to be the proofreading and editing workshop. Same deal here. Uh, the difference between these workshops, uh, in case you're not familiar with this, the difference in the terms, uh, the revision workshop is focusing on the ideas presented. Uh, in this case, you're going to be looking at the argument, whether it makes sense, whether the evidence makes sense, whether the reasoning makes sense, uh, however much logical sense it makes. Okay. Uh, the proofreading and editing workshop is a polish workshop. Uh, by the time you get to this, your, your essay should be a approximately 90% finished. Uh, and it, all it should need is a little bit of touching up uh, in order to get it ready to be turned in. Okay? Uh, so, that is the uh, basic overview of the assignment and its due date. Now, uh, one other thing I want to do is talk over the logical fallacies uh, and at least show you the site that I'm talking about. Uh, where you can look at what you need to avoid. All right, so here we are. This is this website is your logical fallacy is dot com. All right, and this site. Uh, is your best resource on what for what to avoid when you're making a logical uh, when you're making a logical argument such as a classical argument uh, a few things to look at here uh, you notice that these are the most these uh, fallacies are the most common place that you find uh, this is designed for use for social media okay so these are commonplace fallacies that are used in arguments that you find on social media. Now, if you look at the amount that we have here, we have 24 fallacies, okay? Some of them are fairly obvious, uh, like, for instance, the genetic fallacy, which is basically bigotry, okay? Uh, or the uh, appeal to authority, where you basically have uh, basically have said that uh, because somebody in power thinks this, that means it must be true, Okay? Uh, there is one for moving the goalposts, okay? Uh, where is it? Oh, yes, it's also called special pleading, okay? Uh, where when you're proven wrong, you decide to change the uh, conditions to make yourself right again, okay? Uh, some of these are particularly immature, and let's. I also want to talk about some of the ones that are... Uh, more commonplace in arguments in the modern era, okay? Uh, some of the ones that uh, you really want to avoid. So starting here with the straw man, okay? Uh, straw man fallacy misrepresents someone's argument to make it easier to attack. What you're basically doing is creating a parody of your opponent uh, or of their, your opponent's views uh, that is much easier to make seem unreasonable. Okay. Uh, if you look at the example here, after Will said that we should put more money into health and education, Warren responded by saying that he was surprised that Will hates our country so much that he wants to leave it defenseless by cutting military spending. Okay. Obviously, that's not what Will said, but that is what the straw man argument is that Warren is making. Uh, he's going to put more money in health and education by taking it away from defense. Not like it couldn't afford to spare a few bucks. Okay. Uh, straw man is one that's used a lot. Uh, ad hominem, which is basically character assassination. You attack your opponent's character or personal traits in an attempt to undermine their argument. Okay. Uh, so instead of engaging with the argument directly, what you're doing is engaging with the person who's making the argument and trying to find some way to discredit them uh, using stuff that's unrelated. Okay, it's a, it's a direct attack to that person. Uh, the example here, after Sally presents an eloquent and compelling case for a more equitable taxation system, Sam asks the audience whether we should believe anything from a woman who isn't married, was once arrested, and smells a bit weird. None of which has anything to do with a more equitable taxation system. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is another one that's used a lot lately. To Quokwe. 
Avoiding having to engage with criticism by turning it back on the accuser, you answer criticism with criticism. Uh, there is another more commonplace term for this fallacy. It's called whataboutism. Uh, and it's very commonly used in politics, okay? Where you're trying to find, where you're, when somebody's using whataboutism, uh, they are avoiding addressing a criticism by leveling a different criticism and trying to create an idea of uh, moral equality, uh, moral equity, and basically it's a roundabout way of accusing the accuser of being a hypocrite. Okay, uh, It was really popular in the Soviet Union when they were trying to talk about, uh, well, you say we have problems, what about this problem that you have? Uh, and they used it a lot in their diplomatic relations with the U.S. Okay, So, uh, for an example of this, Nicole identified that Hannah had committed a logical fallacy. But instead of addressing the substance of her claim, Hannah accused Nicole of committing a fallacy earlier on in the conversation. So again, what about ism? Okay. Uh, something that you want to avoid in your own arguments. Okay. Uh, let's see. There's another one. There it is. Okay. This is, a, this is one that is particularly uh, aggravating. Okay. Uh, uh, this is called begging the question, and you will see why it's aggravating. And it's also one that's that's actually used by some people when they do not want to ever admit that they are wrong. They want to make sure that they are right right all the time. So if you commit the begging the, begging the question fallacy, you're presenting a circular argument in which the conclusion is included in the premise. Okay. Uh, and also, example: circular reasoning is bad mostly because it's not very good. Okay. I'll give you a couple examples of this, and then I think we're going to wrap it up here. So, uh, the example that they give, the word of Zorbo the Great is flawless and perfect. We know this because it says so in the great and infallible book of Zorbo's best and most truest things that are definitely true and should not ever be questioned. Okay? Uh, so, that's circular logic right there. Okay? Uh, it's begging the question because in the uh, premise, you're you're presenting the conclusion, okay? Uh, another exa good example of this uh, actually comes from a uh, Australian comedian named Tim Minchin. Uh, if you you may have heard of him because he's also done stuff for Broadway. Uh, he also shows up from time to time on James Corden's Late Show, uh, Late Late Show, I should say. Uh, and Tim Minchin, uh, when he performs in concert, he's there's a couple things you need to know about him. One, uh, he has a psychology degree. So one of the things that he loves to do in his comedy is mess with people's minds, okay? Uh, mess with their ex expectations, mess with their thinking, mess with their preconceived notions. Another thing you need to know about him is that he's virulently, virulently atheist, okay? And in fact, he explicitly challenges the logic of, uh, of particularly evangelical Christianity, uh, and he's very much against... Uh, the Catholic Church, uh, specifically because of their scandals involving pedophilia. All right, uh, he's done a lot of stuff about that. Uh, so anyway, Tim Minchin has a song on one of his albums that's titled The Good Book, okay, which has an example of this type of fallacy. It's begging the question. Uh, and in this song, he's basically lampooning people who feel that they don't need any other religion other than the Bible. So the main thesis of the song is the first line, or first couple of lines. Uh, first couple of lines is, uh, I only read one book, but it's a good book, don't you know? We know that it's a good book because the good book tells us so. Okay? That's circular logic. Okay? The book, the book is good because the book says that it's good, so therefore it has to be good. Okay? Uh, not exactly the greatest logical conclusion there. All right, so uh, that concludes things for this week. Uh, it would be a really good idea for you guys to start thinking over what kind of art, classical arguments you want to make. Uh, just as a reminder, we have the uh, exercises from the textbook. Uh, you can go ahead and enter those into uh, eCampus under questions to the professor. Uh, we have the weekly discussion question that you will need to answer. Uh, those can help you in a sense if you want to find a a uh, classical argument question uh, topic from those topics, that would be okay. Uh, 
we will have another Blackboard Collaborate discussion on Thursday. Uh, we will try to get the uh, scheduling correct for those. Again, I do apologize for last week. Uh, and keep it up, and we will, we will uh, continue this next week with another lecture. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.